Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, my name is Rod, and I am an addict and alcoholic. Uh, you're going to have to bear with me here because this is absolutely the first time that I have spoken in front of this many people at once. So I'm definitely a little nervous. Uh, I thought probably the best way to go about this would be uh, how it was, what happened, and what it's like today. And uh, how it was uh, was probably about the same as it was for a lot of us out there. Uh, since I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I found out that I am not the lone wolf that is in the painting. There's, it was a famous painting once that had a lone wolf on the side of a snow-covered mountain, and a wolf stands there looking into a, the light of the cabin. And I used to feel like I was that wolf in that painting. I never felt like I fit, and I never felt like I belonged anywhere. Uh... I started drinking for uh, and using drugs for effect at the age of 12 years old, and uh, by the time I was 16 years old, I had a pretty good heroin habit going. Uh, through my, I guess my teens, growing up, I uh, I never really had a chance to develop a character. Because of starting to drink and use at such an early age, uh, I began to fall back on that in uh, in lieu of uh, everyday life situations. If I had to uh, react to a certain situation, uh, such as a relationship, or uh, had to learn how to handle uh, an instructor, a teacher, or anybody with authority, or whatever it might have been, uh, I would just... Uh, drink and use, and never did develop the character or my own personal way of reacting to life. So when I became an adult, I didn't have what most people learn when they're young and growing up. I didn't have a character. Uh, actually, I was more of a character. Uh, by, uh, by the time I was 18... Uh, it, the, there was a certain amount of denial that I guess that everybody finds out that goes along with this uh, disease of alcoholism and drug abuse. And uh, by the time I was 18 years old, one day I was sitting out in front of a connection's house in a beat-up old Volkswagen, and I was uh, waiting to cop some dope. And uh, I had sat there for like four hours and 105 degrees, and uh, at that point, it dawned on me that I wasn't recreationally using anymore, you know, <laughs> that I actually did have a problem with it. The uh, the uh, the whole term recreational use, I don't understand it. I, I, whether you get dressed up in tennis clothes and use, I, I, did, I have never understood that term, but... Uh, at that point, see, I, I discovered, or I, I, I admitted that I had a problem with alcohol or with, uh, with narcotics, but it never dawned on me that I, I might have had a problem with alcohol because I grew up in a family of people that drank, and, uh, and drinking was uh, no big thing. You know, it was just, it was just part of life. Uh, for a long time, I thought beer was food. And... Uh, so I never really thought I had a problem with, with alcohol. It was, it was only heroin. And, uh, of course anybody could smoke dope. There was, you know, I mean, everything was out on that. If you smoked dope, you weren't an addict. You were just, you know, cool. Uh, and the rest of the stuff, Christ, that was alright. Reds, the doctor, if you had the right doctor, you could, you could get a script of Reds. It was no big deal. Um, so, I continued, I went into the service and, and uh, continued to drink, continued to use, and uh, off and on through my using, I get I get to points to where uh, uh, my heroin habit would get to be a little too expensive, 
and I knew I had to kick and clean up. And I would uh, usually do it by taking a couple fifths someplace and just crawling into a hole for a while and uh, waiting for the heebie-jeebies to pass. Uh, and it, I never, it never dawned on me that I was just replacing one problem for another problem. Uh, I always figured I, my main problem was, 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 a, was a heroin. I went into the service, I came out of the service, and at that point I, I was older. And I had to more or less go into the mainstream of life. Well, by now, my only way of, uh, of reacting to life on life's terms was, uh, whatever drug or, or if I was drinking, what alcohol I had in me, that was the way I reacted to any given situation. You know, if, if I was loaded on dope, or, uh, smoke, I, I mean, I, I'd be mellow. Uh, if I was down on junk, hell, I wouldn't give a shit what went on around me. And, and if I was drunk, uh, uh, I was usually, uh, uh, rowdy and violent. And that's the only way I had to, in life, uh, to react was just to react, you know, due to whatever, uh, stimulus I was under. And I thought that that was fine because we lived in the 20th century and it was better living through chemicals anyway. And I went through, uh, like a lot of us do, uh, my share of uh, relationships, money, jobs, everything else that goes along with drinking and using. And uh, that's just about how my life went. Uh, it got to the point to where uh, probation officers and jail, the county jail was no big deal. Everybody went to the county jail now and then. I had a, a wife, uh, when I first got out of the service, we were married for three years. And uh, one day she came to me and she said that she was leaving me. And uh, I asked her, well, what, how come you're leaving? And uh, she said, well, because you drink entirely too much and you shoot heroin. And I said, well, what's wrong with that? Everybody does that. And in my mind, I actually thought that everybody did do that. Of course, everybody I knew did that. My mother did not do it, but then she was my mother. But everybody else I knew did it. And uh, I couldn't understand why she wanted to leave a fun-loving guy like me, you know, just because I drank and used. And that was the beginning of my starting to get a glimpse or a message through my own head that maybe I've got a problem with alcohol on top of the drug use. I mean, it's no secret if you're shooting heroin, by God, <laughs> it's just not normal to sit in a shooting gallery and pump your arm full of junk. Uh, but the alcohol, I, was, I couldn't, I didn't understand, I, I couldn't understand that I could have a problem with alcohol because it was just, I mean, every macho dude in the world drank alcohol, and I couldn't, I couldn't have that. Uh, and at the, at the, when I lost my first wife, I started wondering if I didn't have a problem with that. So I, I went on to other relationships and, and, uh, other periods in my life, uh, in and out of drinking. And of course, by this time, my drinking had gotten worse and worse, and I was drinking to excess daily, and, uh, getting up and drinking, maintenance drinking, and, and, uh, still with all of this denial that, well, I didn't have a, I didn't have a problem with it. I just didn't have a problem with it. I used to think that my drinking was a direct result of society. And for crime any sakes, if you just watch the news and look around you, by God, it's enough to drive anybody to drink. Uh, so I, I, uh, continued to, uh, live like that, and, uh, I went through uh, probably five years of stopping and starting, stopping and starting, going to the doctor, getting an abuse, taking the an abuse, drinking on top of it anyway, getting sick, not drinking whiskey because I got rowdy behind whiskey, just drinking beer, but then end up drinking a case, and only drinking wine with the meal and being shit-faced by dessert, not drinking at all, only smoking pot. And then I'm walking around so stupid I can't communicate with the rest of the world. And 
then I'm not going to smoke pot or I'm not going to drink at all, and then I just crawl the walls. And uh, finally, it was uh, New Year's Eve of 1979 when uh, I was at a friend's house. And I was not drinking that night because I had just gotten out of jail the prior night for uh, uh, drunk and disorderly. And uh, I decided I wouldn't drink because I would go through these trips when I was drinking. Sometimes I would drink and things were fine. I'd get along great with everybody and, and the worst I'd have the next day would be a terrible hangover. Other times... I don't know what would happen. I'd just snap, and I'd, be, I'd just fly into violent rages. And then whoever was in my way would either get hurt or I'd get my ass kicked, one of the two. And uh, so this particular night of uh, January 1979, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't drinking because I was afraid of the results. So I went to this particular friend's house who was alone with just his two children. And, uh, yeah, I sat there and we, he, he was drinking. He, he commenced to get drunk on his ass. And, and, uh, finally he looked at me and he said, well, he says, you know, if you're really, really worried about your drinking, why don't you call AA? He said, uh, there are some real nice folks in that program. And then he passed out face first on the floor. <laughs> so, the next morning I woke up at 7 o'clock because I wasn't drinking the night before, and uh, I thought I would call somebody and say Happy New Year's. But I couldn't think of anybody that I knew that wouldn't still be drunk or loaded from the night before. And at that point, I realized that uh, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea to call Alcoholics Anonymous. So I called, and they told me that there would be a meeting at uh, Midtown down here in Stockton, and that I'd be welcome to come. So I went to the meeting, my first meeting, and I knocked, walked up knocked on the front door, because it was a residential house. Hell, I, I wasn't even sure I had the right address. And uh, this woman came to the door, opened the door, and she was dressed in high heels and stockings and a real nice dress on, and, and, and uh, an elder, uh, a little... I don't want to call her old, Christ's sakes, but she was an elderly woman with with her hair all done up nice. And I looked past her into the room, and there were people with uh, suits and ties, and some of them were just, you know, dressed up nice. I was standing on the front porch with a with, uh, black eye, and, and uh, I, you know, I just got out of jail the day before that, and I didn't look real good anyway. And uh, I, I thought, Jesus, I, you know, I, I hit another church. This can't be Alcoholics Anonymous. So they, I, and I asked them, is this Alcoholics Anonymous? And they said, yeah, it's, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. Come on in. And, I, and, I, and I, they took me in, and they was having a buffet that day. Uh, so they took me around and fed me first. I guess that, that was the first place they took me was the food table. I must have looked that bad. And uh, they got me a plate of food and took me to, uh, to the meeting room and sat me down. And they got me coffee, and they got me all the things that we get newcomers. And uh, they commenced to have their meeting, and uh, the first thing, the meeting was on spirituality. And then I thought, shit, this is another church. <laughs> and we went through the meeting, and then after that, some, some of the new people took me under the wing, and, and they drove me around and stayed with me for the day and, and made sure that, that everything was, uh, well, I was all right and I wasn't going to drink that day, and invited me back to come to some more meetings. Well, to make a longer story short, I guess I did go back to some more meetings, and uh, there was a part, being a, a real alcoholic and an addict, there was a part that says the only requirement for membership to this program is a desire to stop drinking. My mind picked up on that immediately and reread the the line, and, and I didn't see anywhere in there where it said I had to quit shooting dope. It just said, don't drink. So I continued to make the meetings with smoking dope, shooting dope, eating dope, 
And as a result, I made the monumental decision one day to go ahead and try some more drinking. So I went, got a six-pack of beer, went out onto the levee with my fishing pole, and said, now, okay, now I'm going to be rigorously honest with myself and see just exactly what happens here. So I opened one beer, and I drank it in about five minutes, and I waited for the levee to break. And it didn't break. And I thought, oh, I don't know, maybe I just overreacted. So I I opened another beer and drank it. And I I thought, well, you know, I don't see what everybody's getting so upset about. And I opened up another beer and drank it. And still nothing happened. I had the six-pack drank in 45 minutes. Within an hour, I had another case of beer out on the levee. And about five hours, that was gone. And I went over to Connections House to get a bag of dope. At six o'clock the next morning, I was driving home, throwing up on the inside of the windshield again. Wondering what went wrong. <laughs> Why this happened to me when I said I wasn't going to do this again. Well, prior to coming into Alcoholics Anonymous the first time, you know, I had come to the realization that I might die an alcoholic and an addict and had resigned myself to that fact. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous and Those people talked about another way of living and another way of life. When I went back out, I decided rather than going back into Alcoholics Anonymous, I would go ahead and drink and use myself to death. Because if that's all there was, was not drinking and bingo in AA, I'd just soon die anyway. So I I stayed out for six months. And uh, continued to drink and continued to to use, and the progression got worse. My downward spiral, my downward spiral, uh, started falling straight down. And uh, finally, one night, uh, I came home and I put the key in my door and I opened up my house and I looked inside, and uh, there was nothing there. There was no furniture because I had sold it all. The house uh, was half burnt in the inside because one night I got I got loaded and decided I I needed some money and I thought what I'd do is get drunk and burn the house down and collect the insurance money. Well, the neighbor the neighbor seen a fire, broke the window, and put put the fire out with a garden hose. So I mean, I'm looking at this, okay, and at that moment, that day I had, I had uh, fixed about $300 worth of stuff and, and uh, drank a, a fifth of Sigmund's and a fifth of Blue Nun and, and a six-pack of uh, uh, Budweiser. And I wasn't drunk, and I wasn't loaded, and I wasn't straight, I wasn't sober. But I, I, when I put the key in the door and I looked into the house and looked at the physical wreckage around me, At that moment, it was like I was standing outside of myself looking at myself. And I thought to myself, if I could have planned it like that, I I don't think I would have planned it that way. And uh, at that that moment, I believe that was the first spiritual experience I ever had in this program, Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I looked up and I said, I need help. And that was probably the first honest prayer I'd ever said in my life. So I went back to Alcoholics Anonymous and told all the people in there about what a, what a miserable, lousy time I was having out there and how, 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 how don't go out there and try it because, boy, it gets worse just like everybody said. And there was a big old carpenter guy in the room that stood up and said, you know what, we're not in here to hear people snivel. We're in here to have a meeting. Now, if you sit down and shut up, we go on with our meeting. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened to me because I stayed sober the first six months just to show him I could do this. <laughs> and later talking to him, he told me that's exactly why he did that. So, at that point, uh, 
I, I could not go back out because the fear of living was greater for me than the fear of dying the way that I used to live. So I decided, well, I'll, I'll stay in Alcoholics Anonymous and I will just go there every day and let whatever happens, happen like they suggest. So I started making the meetings and in the beginning they tell you to bring your, your body and, and your mind will follow and that's exactly what I did. And slowly, in spite of myself, the program started to work. And uh, after uh, after about the, uh, well, I guess it was about the first seven months, I had a realization driving to one of the meetings that uh, I had not drank and I had not used for seven months. And at that point, I couldn't believe that this had happened to me, that I actually had made it seven months without drinking and using. And from that point on, I think, is when I, I started to work the program a little more and listen a little harder. And then there was another, there was a person that was put into my life in a, in a form of a relationship about that point that didn't work out. And after that failed, I really started working the steps. And it's funny how a failing relationship will do that to a person. Uh, so I, I started to work the steps to the program Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, and my life started to turn around slowly. And I'm not here to say that it turned around fast. There was a lot of uh, a lot of work, and there was a lot of pain. And uh, and there was a lot of joy mixed in it, too. And as a result, uh, now my life is completely turned around. And I have things that I never dreamed I would, uh, that I would have. Uh, as a result of the program uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous. The first thing I think is that I, uh, I developed a relationship with a God as I understand Him. And that is the most important thing that has happened to me in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It in itself has given me the strength to make it days when I don't think I can go any further. Uh, it's returned to me uh, some serenity and a huge amount of peace of mind. I have, I have been learning the fine art of acceptance. And as, as a direct result of the re acceptance, uh, I honestly feel that that's where a person uh, develops their serenity or gets their serenity. Uh, it has given me back my family. And it has given me back uh, the ability to go out and make a living and to deal with life on life's terms. And it has given me the respect and the admiration of sober and clean people, uh, be it on the program or not on the program. And it has given me, I guess, what do they say, the intuitiveness to deal with problems that used to baffle me. And all of this I've gotten as a direct result of Alcoholics and Narcotics Anonymous programs. And I can't... Gratitude, we have meetings on gratitude sometimes. And uh, it's always a tough subject to talk on. And I honestly believe that that the subject of, of uh, gratitudes and, and, and what it's like today is actually what we need to talk about more because while we shouldn't forget the past well, well while we shouldn't live in the past we should not forget about the past either and too many times uh, we have a tendency to dwell on the past and the uh, the present I believe is God's gift to us 
from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the benefits that we reap in the present as a result of the program are what the program is about. And in the, uh, as, a, as a direct result of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, we talk about gratitude. And for me, it, it's hard to talk about because I don't have the words in my vocabulary to explain the way I feel. But the only thing I can say is, is if I could zip myself open and you could get inside and walk around for a little bit and you could come back out again, then you could experience the magnitude of gratitude that I feel as a result of this program. And it's uh, definitely been the, the greatest thing in my life. I always thought in my heart that I, would go, I was going to go on this long journey, something like a, a merchant sailor or something like that. And uh, I had no idea that the greatest journey in the world I was going to take was going to be in my own head. Well, I, I don't know. I think my 15 minutes is about up. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm running out of stuff to say without repeating myself. So i just like to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. This brings us to the portion of the meeting where we're going to hear our, our main speaker, who is handling this, I think, much better than, than I am. Uh, I met Annie and, and shook her hand right before I opened the meeting, and she commented on how cold and clammy my hand felt. <laughs> like Rod said, this is kind of a, <clears throat> a large group for me. Um, but my sponsor told me to hang around people who have something that I want. So I sat next to Annie while Ron was speaking, and I hope I didn't crowd you or anything. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry I drank all your water. <laughs> <laughs> Annie seems so calm, you know. I thought maybe some of it would rub off. <laughs> Please welcome Annie B. from Cameron Park. I'm Annie and I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Cameron Park group of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I haven't had a drink of alcohol since January the 25th, 1967. One day at a time. You know, and in response to what Mark just said, I, uh, you know, we don't change, do we? <laughs> Patricia came up with me to uh, the roundup, and, and uh, she suffered through my butterflies all day long. You know, I'm not sure whether I just have anxiety or the flu. <laughs> and I know I'm going to feel a lot better at 930. Um, I like, like Rod, you know, I have, uh, the last time I think I spoke to a, a group this size was a number of years ago. And I had been asked to go down to San Francisco and uh, speak at their uh, monthly speaker meeting down there. And that was when I was really into saving people. And I knew that I would and uh, went down. And, and they had it was an amphitheater type uh, meeting place. And, and uh, God, they came in and they packed the place. It was like it was tonight, you know. And uh, I really thought that I had a message to give and that, that I should be saving folks and and I talked for, I was, it was supposed to be an hour and a half meeting, and I talked for about 45 minutes, and we didn't have a, a 15 minute, uh, warm up speaker at the end, or whatever you call them. And, and I was like, Rod, and I was through, and I didn't have anything more to say, and I was absolutely terrified. I, I did the whole meeting, and, and I never did get out of the fear, and, and get into being, you know, a part of us. 
And uh, I said I quit. I'm through. And, and Jack Gardner was the central office secretary at the time. And he said, you know, Annie, that's really okay because a lot of people go on and don't have anything to say and they don't even know that they're through. And so, you know, <laughs> it made me feel a lot better except that, you know, I really knew that I hadn't saved anybody because when the hall began to clear out, here's this one poor little drunk, 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 still passed out up there on those steps. So <clears throat> the other thing I need to say is that I feel that, you know, I have a job to do here tonight, and so do you, okay? And mine is to be a channel, and I'd really like to ask my higher power now to make me that channel, and if he has a message for us tonight, that I be that channel, and you have a responsibility to listen and hear the message that's there for you. And I'm sure if we both do our job, there is a message there. I want to say I'm really grateful to the three that identified themselves as new in the fellowship in the first 30 days. I must have something to share with you that you haven't learned yet. I've been here for 23 years, and you've been here for 30 days, and that's the reason for my being here, is to share something with you. That also goes for the other ones that are in their first 30 days and weren't courageous enough to raise their hand. There may or not may be in the audience tonight. Um... I've given 10,000 pitches in my mind today. No, no, not just today. I've done it ever since. Well, I guess when Will called me at first, and then I verified it again last Tuesday with Val. You know, there was the one that once upon a time in the state of Nebraska, there was a fairy princess born to a loving family that really didn't know how to love, and her name was Annie Lee. Does anybody in the room identify with a fairy tale? You know? And that was the way I lived for a lot of years. You know, and, and, and I hear people say that, you know, I just really didn't feel... Oh, by the way, I came from a functional family. <laughs> you know, and they functioned really well. They didn't do things like we do things somewhat today, but that was a lot of years ago. Anyhow, we function pretty well. But I grew up with real feelings of insecurity in not belonging. When I was about in the sixth grade, I decided that I was adopted. Now, this is in the middle of the Depression. I was in the middle of a family of seven, and I am so <laughs> self-centered that I thought they were going to adopt somebody, you know, they had problems. They were already raising two cousins that, you know, they didn't have to. Um, I went to movies as much as, off, as often as I possibly could, and I really believed that life was like what they showed on the golden screen or silver screen, or it should have been that way, you know, and my family wasn't. So I became ashamed of my family. We grew up, I grew up on a farm that did not have electricity. It didn't have running water. It didn't have an inside bathroom. And I was not deprived. We were poor, and I didn't know it. I didn't know it until I actually went to high school and um, really was around people that had electricity and running water and inside bathrooms. But there are a lot of things that we had in our home that a lot of other people didn't have. You know, one of my neighbors didn't have a mother. One of my other neighbors had an alcoholic father. Um, you know, it, it, we were a functional family. But I was insecure within myself. I didn't know how to relate to people. And it was the way that I accepted life or didn't accept life. When I, I was okay in the family at home, but when I went to school, I didn't feel a part of. I didn't feel as smart as. I didn't feel as good as. Um, and I struggled and I fought with that all of my life. I think that's one of the reasons that my head kind of went so crazy today, you see. And, and, and I will allow my head to tell me that I'm different from you, that we aren't one. And that's not true. We are one. Um, I found alcohol when I was about 13. And at every opportunity that I had to drink, I drank. And from the very beginning, when I drank, I drank alcoholically. And for me... The meaning of drinking alcoholically means that once I've taken a drink, I can't guarantee you my behavior. And that doesn't mean that if I say I'm going to drink one drink, that that might not happen. But I couldn't guarantee it would happen. And that was through, true throughout all my drinking. 
I uh, I got through high school without any problems and and uh, went from high school to Omaha and went to work and came to California and went back from California and was married. And uh, my first husband was killed in an automobile accident when we were married a year and three months. And, yeah, I had drank off and on, but it hadn't appeared to be progressive. But when he was killed in that accident, it was such a tragedy. And, you know, I knew how it would have been. And my solution was to drink through it. I was staying, I went home and I lived with my parents. And that was probably the most amoral, uncontrolled, unacceptable drinking that I had in my life. And I grew up in this little town that where alcoholic drinking was acceptable. And they accepted all of that unacceptable behavior because it was so tragic that a 21-year-old had lost her husband. And, you know, and my life was down the tubes as far as I could see it. I stayed at home with my folks and I taught school a year and uh, uh, went to college. And my, my drinking was really getting progressive at this time. And... Uh, I went to college for a couple of years and was finally kicked out of college. I wrecked a car in a drunken binge and, and uh, was told that I couldn't come back, and I talked him into letting me finish the semester. And on one vacation between semesters, I'd come to California and had run into a fellow that I had gone to grade school with. And uh, had decided that if they weren't going to keep me in college, uh, I was of the old school that believed that if I wasn't in college and didn't have a job, you know, I was supposed to get married anyhow. So I called Bob, and, and he said, come out. And I came to California, and we were going to be married. But it was in the winter time, and he didn't have a job. And so uh, we decided to wait until spring. He was an operating engineer, and uh, he uh, he wasn't working. And when he did go to work, Spring came around, and he went to work, and uh, as so often happens, his fancy turned to someone else. You know, I think he'd just really gotten tired of my compulsive, horrible, unacceptable drinking. And um, so I went off on a binge with other people, and I found myself another lover. And, and we had a relationship for a period of time, and he was a real con, and he conned me out of my car and out of this and out of that and took off. And a few months later, he called up and said, you know, I'd really like to have you join me in Southern California. So I stole money from my nephew's piggy bank and went off to Southern California and played house with him for, uh, I don't know how long, until he came home one day and said, I'm leaving. You know, I was a real, real successful uh, relationship uh, person. You know, I really was successful in choosing men. Um, I was really, for, you know, God took care of my life, though, because when he, this guy said he was leaving, I moved in with a family that I'd known in Nebraska, and about a week later, my mother and dad showed up. If my mother and dad had showed up a week before and found me living with this guy, you know, it was not then like it is today. I don't know what would have happened. Anyhow, my father didn't think I should stay in Southern California, and he told me to come on back up to Redwood City where I had a sis sister living. I stayed with her for a while until she threw me out because she was so concerned. She was pregnant and she was worried about my drinking, coming home late, the carousing around that I was going to get in trouble. And she was being held responsible for my behavior because my dad had told her to look after me. I'm four years her senior. I moved out. <laughs> I moved out, moved into a, one of the swanky hotels in South San Francisco, and I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that area, but there are no swanky hotels in South San Francisco. <laughs> swanky because it was really close to one of the local water and holes that I could get to easily from the job. I stayed there until I found an apartment that was really appropriate for my income and my uh, alcohol appetite. It rented for $50 a month. It had wallpaper that was barely hanging on the walls. It had cupboards that had no doors. Uh, and it was a studio apartment. My brother-in-law helped me clean it up a little bit, and I lived there. And my alcoholism progressed. It progressed to the extent that I was, by this time, I'm running around with a married man that ran a, a used furniture store next door. And he had, I'll tell you what I thought an alcoholic was. I thought an alcoholic was the guy that he had working for him. And that man was probably in his uh, early 40s. He had an 8-year-old son. 
and he was married to a woman that had a hair lip that he was extremely ashamed of. And this man was drunk all the time. And a lot of the time he was drunk to the extent that he could hardly walk. And when he couldn't walk, he'd get in his car, put his eight-year-old son on his lap. He'd manipulate the brakes and the gas, and the kid would steer the car. That guy was an alcoholic. So you can see why I didn't realize or know or think that I was an alcoholic. Um, by the time I was 28, I need to tell you a story of what happened when I was about 10 years old. I was coming home from school one day with this neighbor, kid that was in the same grade. And my parents were about 40 and his parents were about 50. And we were talking about those old folks. And we both decided that we had absolutely no understanding whatsoever of what people did after they were 30 years old. Now, I don't know where this came from, but neither of us could understand why people would even want to live, even be around after 30 years. So I suppose that came from the theater, too. I don't know. But when I was 28 years old, guess what happened? My mind said, you are old. You have nothing to live for. Why are you hanging around? Your life is a mess. God. Bob and I, the fellow that I'd come out here to marry, had been going together off and on and had our fights and separations and back together. So at age 28, when there was nothing else to live for, I called one more time and suggested that we start going out together. And uh, we did. And we got married. Uh, it was over 4th of July, and we'd gotten really drunk, and we're sitting in his mother's house. And I said, you know, you're going to have to get me to the airport and get me back down to San Bruno, because if you don't, if I don't show up this holiday, I won't have a job, and I'll have no way to support myself. And you're going to have to marry me and support me. And he accepted my proposal. And we, <laughs> and we were married on the 15th of July, happily married on the 15th of July, 1955. And um, that was the, the beginning of the end. Uh, Bob and I were married for uh, about 15 years. Uh, our marriage ended in about 1962, but we lived together until about 1971. Um, we, you know, it was, it was, Bob and I probably were married for all the wrong reasons. We were two really nice people that just plain old could not live together. We couldn't communicate with each other. We didn't know how to be kind to each other. Uh, we didn't know how to be giving to each other. Uh, and no matter, there were, there were times, you know, it wasn't all bad. But they, but most of it was. We just it was just only on special times that we were able to be kind. And it finally reached the point. You know, we couldn't. We we stopped drinking in the bars together. We stopped going any place together. We stopped doing anything at all together except fighting. You know, and that's that's no marriage. And then you know we stopped sleeping together, and and there was just nothing there. And uh, as this ha you know, my drinking got worse, and his drinking got worse. And in the end, I'm sitting in a recliner around the clock with a bottle, most of the time in my terry robe, rarely ever going to, to bed, mine or his. I didn't know whether it was night or day. I was a blackout drinker from the very beginning. And, and I'd wake up, and, and that was in the days when, you know, they didn't have movies around the clock. And if it was snow on the TV screen, I knew it was nighttime. And if it wasn't, I assumed it was day or evening. I can't tell you today for sure where I got my booze. I know I stole it from Bob's bottles a lot. Um, I was drawing unemployment. I might, I had graduated from college and, and um, uh, had a degree in education, had stopped teaching that I was able to hold. The last job that I held was as a, um, in a fruit shed making cardboard boxes. And that job was okay because I could drink on that job. And I did drink on that job. But I was, I would reach the point where they wouldn't have hired me back. And I'm sure of that. And it was Bob's fault. 
somebody identified. Yeah, you know, it was if he had just communicated, if he had just talked to me, if he had just been kinder to me, if he had just been more understanding, if we had just taken vacations together, if he had just held my hand, if he had just, you know, it was all his fault. You'd have drank too if you'd have been married to the son of a bitch. <laughs> So, um, I didn't, I was, I, I had drank so much and I was in blackout so much that, you know, I didn't have any friends anymore either. Nobody could communicate with me anymore. If you tried to call me, I wouldn't remember that you had called. I spent some time trying to write down the fact that you had called me and that we'd made a date or something, and my writing had gotten so bad that I couldn't read it. And so I never kept appointments. And so, you know, eventually people just stopped trying to communicate with you. So here I'm married to this drunk that I don't want to be married to, and, and I just I knew I had to change my life. It was, you know, this was the beginning of the end, and I didn't know that. So I decided the one way that I could... Uh, get out of this morass that I was in was to, to get back with people. And the only way that I knew to be with people at that time, I still belong to the American Legion Auxiliary. Don't ask me how. I, I don't know. Anyhow, I was going to go to American Legion Auxiliary meeting, and I got dressed. Always drunk. Never, you know, I, I'm drunk around the clock. I am not sober when I got dressed to go to that meeting. Got in the car, and I'm late. And I headed out for the fairgrounds at the American Legion, and some guy in a truck pulled in front of me, and I almost hit him. I was so angry with that man that I was going to stop him and make a citizen's arrest because of his driving. And I followed him out Pleasant Valley Road until I lost him. Because I was, I used to say, because I, you know, I was trying to follow his license plate and I couldn't get it because it was covered with mud. I don't know whether his license plate was covered with mud or not. I'm sure I was driving with one eye closed so I could watch the white line on the road. Anyhow, I lost him and I turned around to go back to that meeting, hurrying, and I have a lead foot anyhow. And um, I got off on the side of the road. It's kind of, that was kind of a curvy little old mountain road, and I hit the soft shoulder, and I lost control of the car, and I hit an oak tree head on. I'll tell the Jesus story. Anyhow, the highway patrol were coming up the highway and saw me hit the oak tree. And I was going at such speed that they were quite sure that they were going to find a corpse. But what they found, you know, I'm staggering out of the car. I've lost a shoe. And I'm standing there babbling about finding Jesus Christ's hand. I had a little plastic statue, and he'd fallen off the dash and broken his hand off. And I'm asking him to find my shoe and to find the plastic hand of Jesus Christ that had fallen off my dashboard. And they were so disgusted. They picked me up and took me to the hospital because... I really had I really had done severe damage to the car. I'd pushed the motor back into the front end and I'd bent the steering wheel and and cracked some ribs. Anyhow, they took me into the hospital and I was I was really ugly there too. You know, they the usual procedure at the time was to um have the doctor that was on call come in and take care of the patient in the emergency room. And I told them I wanted my doctor, and they said that's not the way we do it. I told them I didn't give them a damn how they did it, that I wanted my doctor. So they called him, and he came, and the highway patrol waited. And we were in the emergency room, and the doctor fixed up the broken little broken bone in my wrist and put a cast on and and gave me a brace for my cracked ribs and wheeled me out of the room on the gurney. And the officers very politely said that they would like to take a breath test. And I said, you can't because I have broken ribs. And they said, well, we'll do a blood test then. And I said, oh, you can't. I've lost too much blood already. And they said, lady, if you don't cooperate, we're going to have to take you to jail. And I said, oh, you can't do that. My doctor's admitted me to the hospital, haven't you, doctor? And he said, yes. And I never had a drunk driving charge in all my years of drinking. And it certainly wasn't because I didn't deserve it. But, you know, I didn't have it. Um, I got a, a reckless driving, had been drinking. And at that time, my insurance company found out that just about a year before, I had gotten an open container felony charge 
that time I'd run a highway patrolman right over the divider in the highway. and He was a little unhappy. <laughs> he was mad as hell. But he listened to me cry and whine and spew, and he took my bottle and gave me an open container instead of a drunk driving. And went back and picked up the bottle and paid 50 to some dollar fine and bragged about being the most expensive whiskey I'd ever drank. But anyhow, after this incident, I can't remember whether they kept me a day or two in the hospital and I went home and I drank. Because I still didn't realize, you know, it was the booze that was causing the problem. But you know, Rod said it. You know, the booze didn't work for me any longer. I couldn't get drunk and I couldn't get sober. And I think somewhere in that having made some kind of a decision to make a change, there was a beginning of a spiritual awakening for me, and I didn't know that. My awakenings have been just almost like it is when I wake up in the morning, you know. Just because I open my eyes doesn't mean that I'm awake. It takes me a while, you know, to get it together. Um, I drank for about ten days, you know, and I knew I was going to have to get rid of that guy that was all the cause of all my problems. And the truth came through that if I got rid of that guy that was the cause of all my problems, I was going to have to go to work. And if I went to work, I was going to have to get dried out because I couldn't stop drinking by myself. Now, I didn't want to stop drinking, but I didn't want to continue drinking like I was. So I was going to get dried out and go back to the social drinking that I had done before. And I didn't know any way to do it except to call AA. You see, I knew about AA because I'd gone to Al-Anon. And I'm, well, I'm here to tell you it doesn't work. I went drunk. And do you know he continued to drink whether I went to Al-Anon or not? So it doesn't work. And, uh, uh, I called up, uh, we used to, when, we, when I went to Al Anon, we used to meet in the lady's house whose husband was a member of AA. And I called their house and, uh, because I decided, you know, AA would help me stop drinking until I could go back to drinking socially. But Connie wasn't at home, so I called a lady that was in Al Anon. A lady that has a friend of mine and a neighbor, and we had introduced her to the drunk that made it necessary for her to go to Al Anon. And uh, she was really excited that I had called and had finally decided to go to A. And I'm sure that she had known for some time that I was in need of the fellowship. And she gave me a telephone number to call. And that person's here tonight with us. But he wasn't there that night. Uh, and she said, I'll continue to try and reach somebody in AA too. Just don't change your mind and don't go away. Anyhow, she did, and uh, I had, I was, I, you know, it took him forever. It took her forever. No, she got through to this fellow, and he called me. And that was fine. I was really grateful that it was a man that had called, because I sure didn't want to talk to any of you women. And he talked to me and said that his wife was at some kind of a pottery meeting or something or other, and as soon as she got home, why, they'd come up. And I suggested that he just come on up now and not wait until she came back, because I didn't need to talk to her anyhow. And he said, no, well, well, I think we'll wait until she comes back. So he did, thank God. And uh, another lady... I forgot. Anyhow, another little red-headed gal and... and uh, Mary and Vern came to my house, and when they arrived, I told them it had just taken them so long to get there that I'd poured me another drink, and I was going to drink it. And they said, it's your choice. And for you guys that are in the back and that are new, that's what you've got here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's a choice. And the choice is yours. Now, until those people came and they told me that, I didn't have a choice any longer as to whether I drank or didn't drink. But that's basically what Alcoholics Anonymous gives us. And I chose to drink that drink. But that's the last one that I've chosen to drink. They sat there, and I can't tell you a thing in the world of what they said that night. But that night I went to bed. Didn't sleep in their recliner, got out of the terry rope, didn't drink all night long, got up the next morning, didn't have to drink, didn't even think about drinking. Only thing I could think about was how in the hell can I get out of this? They had said they'd pick me up the next night and take me to a meeting.
And I did not. Oh, my God, you've done it again. You made a commitment to do something, and you don't even know who these funny folks are or anything else, you know, and you don't know what Alcoholics Anonymous is really about and how you're going to get out of it. And I paced, but I didn't drink. I picked up the phone, and I called to tell them, finally, I got courageous enough to do that, that I wasn't going to be able to go to the meeting with them. And Vern answered the fellow, and, and, and I said, you know, I've got, I've got this cast on my arm, and I've got this brace on my ribs, and I, you know, I can't even get a bath and get into clothes and get dressed. And the weather is terrible. The wind was blowing. This is in January. And it was just awful. And I said, you know, when the weather clears up and I won't have so much trouble getting dressed, then I'll go to an AA meeting with you. And he said, if you wanted a fifth of whiskey, you'd find some way to get your clothes on and you'd go out in weather like this and we'll be by to pick you up. What do you do, you know? You take a bath and you get dressed and you go out to the meeting. And uh, there weren't meetings all over the place like there are now. And the closest meeting was on San Juan in in Sacramento. And there was a carload of us. And one other brand new spanking baby, Janine and I. And we went down and uh, went to that meeting and sat in awe. Listen to you guys tell stuff that we worked real hard to hide. And there was a girl there named Heidi. And Heidi said she was an alcoholic and she drank two glasses of wine a day. Oh, my God. I'm drinking about a fifth a day. I've got to be an alcoholic. You know, and this is going through my head. Because at that time, you know, I thought that how much you drank decided whether you were an alcoholic or not. And uh, they don't, they didn't encourage us to try to do a lot of talking when we first came in. In fact, what they used to tell us, sit down, shut up, take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth because you don't know anything. And that's true. They did ask at the end of the meeting if we wanted to say anything. And, uh, you know, and there's a half a minute left. And I said... I'm Annie, and I'm an alcoholic, and I cry, you know, and I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a great relief. I think it was a great embarrassment. It was a great shame. You know, there's a lot of guilt. But it was the beginning of the end, you know, the beginning of the surrender. Janine did the same thing. You know, and the beautiful part of not having meetings on every corner was that we did have to get in the car and we did have to go places. And it's a lot more comfortable to ask dumb questions in the dark when you don't have to look somebody in the face and ask the dumb questions. You know, it, I found it just, you know, it was just really great. I'd been going to meetings for about two months, I guess it was, and, and we went to a meeting and, and uh, they started talking about sponsorship. And I hadn't heard anything about sponsorship. My eyes wouldn't focus when I first came in. I couldn't read the big book. And uh, so anyhow, um, after the meeting was over, I rushed to this lady who had come up to make the 12-step call on me. And I asked her, you know, what the sponsorship stuff was and where did I find one and was she mine? And she said, yes, she was mine until I was well enough to be able to choose someone. And, you know, I could let her know. And, you know, I believe today that God puts the people in our lives that we need to have in our lives. I was an arrogant, outspoken, belligerent, antagonistic bitch when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I frightened most people. I frightened most people away, you know. But this lady was able to be really nurturing and loving and kind and caring to me. And she had daily contact with me. You know, today I hear people say, give that newcomer telephone numbers and pick up the phone and call. Thank God you didn't tell me that when I came. Mary had daily contact with me. She either called me or she came and got me. I wrecked my car, remember? She took me to her house. She just let me sit there and be. I could be the lump I was. She taught me how to knit. My first garments were fabulous. Lacy like you wouldn't believe. And like they weren't supposed to be. (laughs) 
But Mary gradually taught me how to be able to do things for myself, you know. I'll never forget the first time that she said, we're not going to be able to pick you up and take you to the meeting tonight. And I said, well, I won't go. And she said, of course you'll go. And, and I said, but I don't know how. And she said, you will. And I did. And I began to feel grown up. God, I got to an AA meeting all by myself. You know, I'm 40 years old and I don't know how to get four blocks, you know. It's unreal. We had a 13th stepper in our group. <laughs> And I thought I was the only one that was the center of his attention. Nothing egocentric about me. But he used to go to a lot of these same meetings that a bunch of us would go. But it got to where he was go Oh, I went to work when I was less than six months sober. And that's okay. Anyhow, he used to call me at the office a lot. And this one day he called and he said, we're going to a meeting in Rancho Cordova tonight. And I said, fine, get a hold of Mary and Vern. And that was all right. And he said, no, they're not going to go. I said, well, I'm not going to go. And he said, oh, yeah. I called Mary and Vern. Mary said, no, we're not going to go. And I said, well, then you tell him that I'm not going. And she said, no, you tell him that you're not going. I don't know how to tell him I'm not going. How many of you in the room know how to say no? I didn't either. So I went. But and, and we sat in the meeting, and, and he played kneesies, and I was really uncomfortable. My mind was probably in crazier shape than it has been all day today, you know, because it was not at the meeting. It was, you know, what's going to happen after the meeting, because I still don't know how to say no. And after the meeting's over, and we're headed the wrong direction, going down Motel Row in Rancho Cordova, and he's saying, well, which motel do you want to go to? And I decided defiance, you know, you go ahead and choose it, but I want the most expensive one there is on the motel row here. <laughs> and it kind of stopped him, and he turned around and he headed back for Placerville. <laughs> to show you, there was, and as I said, I thought I was the only one that he was he was chasing after, but there was a little gal that was in Al-Anon, and she used to run the, uh, the uh, cafeteria for uh, the county at the time. And one day she came down to my desk to talk with me. And she said, you know, Annie, I don't know what in the world I'm going to do. She said, "My her husband was not in AA. And she said, you know, I think my husband has finally agreed to come to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And we used to have open meetings at the time. And she said, if he comes to that meeting and this 13th stepper is there and makes those pitches toward me like he's been doing, she said, he'll kill him. And I said, he's making pitches for you? <laughs> and, you know, thanks. And I thought that I was the only one. Anyhow, uh, what am I doing time-wise? I sure feel a lot better. Um, and and we're, we're us now. Um, you know, I took the steps. When it got so painful to not take them that I couldn't do it anymore. You know, and I took them half-assed until it became so painful that I had to just put my whole heart in it. Um, everything I've learned, I've really learned the hard way because it, I find it so difficult to let go. I think the thing I really uh, want to dwell on, my life is, is so absolutely beautiful today that there is just no comparison. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me so much there, there is no way that I can tell you what it's about. One of the things that I promised myself that I would try to remember to share tonight, and that sounds goofy that I'm going to say this after what I've just said. <clears throat> I have a higher power in my life today that is, is, is the closest thing that I have that fulfills all my needs and most of my wants. And it's always for my good. And I never knew that. And when I hear people say, God, I got this job and it was just exactly like what I wanted. And it was God's will. You know, and I have learned that God's will, there was an old, old pilot rock bill. He used to say, you know, God is not a celestial bellhop. He is not up there to fill your orders, Annie Bear. You know, and, and, you know, he's, we are here to learn from him, to learn what God's will is for us. 
You know, and the more that we get, the more I get myself out of the way and attempt to learn what God's will is for me, the better my life is. About five years ago, and I'm in my teens in recovery, I went into a real depression. And I believe that the beginning was because I had gotten old again. I was about 58, and I had gotten old. And it's one more time of the black hole, what's light, what's in life that's worth living. You know, who can possibly love you in, in, that, in that condition and at this stage? And uh, I really went downhill. And when, when this begins to happen for me, my head begins to tell me all of the lies that go along with being totally unacceptable. And when my head begins to tell me, and these are real beliefs for me, it gets put into practice, whether it be true or not. No matter how kind and loving you appear to be to you, my mind interprets it as non-loving and unkind. So I spent about a year in denial and working my program. God, I beat my program to death, and I beat me to death trying to work my program and get better. And it didn't get better. So I stopped smoking. And then I really got depressed. And I'm really working my program. And, uh, you know, I thought suicide... And I can't commit suicide. You know, that it's not an option. Drinking isn't an option. I didn't even think about drinking. I just wanted to die. And uh, and I kept looking for solutions, you know, out there. One of the girls that had come into the fellowship in Cameron Park had spent a lot of time in and out of mental institutions. And I knew if she, if anybody knew anything about it, you know, maybe she did. So I called Nora one day, and we were off to Fresno. I was going to do a workshop in service. I'm really involved in in service. And uh, uh, I'm driving down the highway. Nora's in the car with me. And I'm, I'm just sitting there, and I'm driving, and I'm crying, and I don't have any reason in the world to be crying, except I'm depressed. And I think depression is as sick a disease as alcoholism. It's a disease where we deny it where we refuse to recognize it, where we are ashamed of it, where we shouldn't do it, where we're not okay if we do do it. And today I don't believe that any of this is true. One of the best pieces of advice that Nora had to give me was one that she said had been shared with her by some of the best doctors that she had gone to. And that is, you know, when you are in that depressed state, and you cannot deal with it, and you feel like crawling under the bed and kicking your heels, or standing in the middle of the room and screaming, or whatever it is, you give yourself full permission to do that, but you set a time limit on it. And when the time is up, you stop and you get about the living. But the key in that is to give yourself permission to do it. If you do it and trash yourself for having done it, you haven't helped yourself at all. If you don't give yourself permission and you don't do it, you're always going to want to be able to do it. And you're still in in, in a mess. And that helped. But it didn't get me out of the depression. And depression is biological as well as psychological. And I went to a doctor that I had known for over 20 years that was a psychiatrist and one that I knew and respected and that I knew dealt with alcoholics and was not into pushing drugs. And by the way, I am not an addict, but I don't believe that we should abuse drugs no matter what. Anyhow, I went to doctor uh, and uh, he gave me a medication and it did not work. It made me really sick. And we changed the medication, and I took it for about 30 days. And I told him it was very expensive and asked him if he could prescribe something that would do the same thing and wasn't as expensive. 
And he gave me another prescription. And when I had that one filled, because by this time I have taken the medication for about 40 days, and I'm beginning to be a little anxious because I've heard how we've talked about using drugs in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said to him, Doctor, how long will I have to take this? And he said, you will know when you won't need to take it. And I thanked him. And it was just another 30-day prescription. And somewhere in that 30 days, I began to forget to take the medication. And I was going to leave and go on vacation, and I probably had, you know, another week and a half, maybe two weeks of, of the medication left. And I called him, and I told him I'm going to be gone for about a month. And I said, but I don't think that I need to fill the medication again because I've been forgetting to take it. And he said, then you don't need it. And that was the beginning of my coming out of the depression. And it is a physical thing, that would be, uh, endorphins or whatever. I, I can't tell you what it is. There was a program on television the other day that tells it about it. But we, our, our bodies stop functioning probably, properly. It's a real chemical imbalance. And with that, then I was able to come back to the fellowship, you know, and really truly practice my program and begin to get about the business of living again. You know, and it doesn't, I wasn't able to just bounce back to where I had been before. I had to rebuild my recovery. I had to rebuild what my life had been. You know, I sat in the meeting Thursday night in, at Appleseed in, in Placerville. And my heart sang with the presence of the people that were there and the love and the sharing that was going on. I sat in the meeting last night as Mike shared and listened to his story of recovery. You know, and I just love this fellowship. I knew Mike when he was a kid, a little kid. I knew his mom, you know, and, and they're sober today. They're sober today, and it's just, it just, this room is full of people that I've known for some time, that I just love, and that have given to me far above and beyond anything that I could have ever imagined from watching the silver screen. You know, if I had settled for those things that I had thought that I wanted, that I saw there, I would have settled for second best. So I guess that the best that I can say to you is don't drink and go to meetings and get a sponsor that you use and read the big book, preferably for yourself, and um, get into service. You know, um, I attempted to uh, try to prepare myself to come and share with you tonight. One of the things that I was going to do was listen to the big book again. And there were so many other things that I had to be doing I couldn't listen to at all. But one of the things in Bill's story, Bill talks about, you know, um, faith without works is it faith without works is dead? Yeah, okay. And you hear that a lot in meetings, right? But the, what he says after that is the real hooker. Because it goes on to talk about, he goes on to talk about having to share with another alcoholic and how important it is that we sacrifice in our sharing. You know, and so often today I hear people say, oh, I was already in bed. I wasn't going to make that 12-step call. Well, I don't want to be a secretary for crying out loud. I'd have to be there an hour early. You know, and that's, you know, when when Vern and Mary came to make that 12-step call on me, they got out in rotten weather, and they came to see me. When Mary came and picked me up every day, that was a sacrifice. She didn't have to do that. When they hauled me around to meetings, that was sacrifice. Whoever the secretary was that opened those meetings, that was sacrifice. Whoever washed those dirty cups, you know. And if we aren't willing to do that today, I'm not so sure. Well, Bill said, we won't live. And on that happy note, I don't know what else to tell you. You know, I hope 
and pray, God, that everybody in this room here tonight doesn't ever have to take a drink. I know everybody in this room here tonight does not have to take a drink again. I just hope we all don't. Let's walk from here in love and service. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.